So welcome everybody. Um, I'm Hayley Eber, I'm the Associate Dean here. And it is with so much enthusiasm that I welcome today's speaker, Mokena Makeka. Um, after just a couple of months, Mokena is now a familiar face at Cooper. He's an adjunct faculty member teaching a very well-received elective entitled Don't Touch My Hair and has been an invaluable member of our anti-racist task force uh, throughout the summer. I met Mokena in 95 uh, when we were the first entering class in architecture at the University of Cape Town of the post-apartheid era. During that time, the school committed itself to a deliberate and planned process of internal transformation, much like where we are today. And it was a riveting time to address these issues of political, social, and spatial practices through the lens of the built environment. And knowing Mokena's work, that context had a profound impact on the direction of his practice and his scholarship. Uh, right out of school, Mokena launched his practice, pursuing his dream of changing the world through the spaces that people inhabit. And Makeka Design Lab, which was his practice for 20 years, engaged in innovative design solutions at the urban, architectural, cultural, and installation scale. I recall an early highlight was his selection for, as one of the Ordos 100 architects selected by Herzog and Demuron and Ai Weiwei, and as one of the only two African architects for that project, uh, Mokena represented not only a generation, but an entire continent. Uh, Mokena has the most extensive list of accomplishments and accolades I've ever seen on a CV. I think somewhere in there he cured cancer <laughs> and I, I just lost track. Yeah, right. um, so I won't even begin to attempt to sift through all that. And knowing how humble he is, it would just make him blush. So I'll just stop right there. But I will tell you that Mokena is one of the 40 cultural leaders of the World Economic Forum of Davos, um, recognized for speaking truth to power and seeking change for a better world. He's a sought after speaker and thought leader on African cities, design and social spatial practices and also demographic change. He's also recently the founder of the House of Mokeka, a premium lifestyle suite of design and product experiences working to change the world through thought, smart and thoughtful design. So without further delay, I'm going to hand it over to my dear friend, Mokena Makeka. Um, Haley, you got my, my heart pumping. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for such a, a warm introduction. I also really want to thank everybody at uh, Cooper Union students and and leadership alike for allowing me to, to participate in some conversations around some of these sticky issues that have to do with transformation and race and identity. And I must say it's been an absolute pleasure, uh, partly because it feels like the, the maturation, if you will, of a a process that has long been in becoming. Um, Haley, you'll recall that when you were studying at UCT that these conversations were very difficult to have and they probably never really happened openly, certainly not with staff. So to be in a space where we can share some of these ideas, where often as a student, you feel that you're learning alone, or if you're learning, you're learning in spite of a system, not with the system. So it's really been an honor and a privilege to, to interact with the staff who are clearly passionate about this issue and, and the students who are also passionate and for me to learn and for me to test some of my um, ideas and to be challenged, so I'm super, super grateful. Um, I'm really looking forward to today's uh, chat um, uh, and discussion. Uh, I've tried to pick a number of projects that, that really kind of speak to my ethos and some of my concerns. Some of them are built, some of them are not built. Uh, I'm looking forward to a conversation on some of these issues. And, and really, uh, these are experiments in practice. I think it's quite important to put it that way. I see my work as a mode of exploring ideas. I also want to give a shout out to um, Professor Matthew Barrick, if he's online. I just wanted to specifically to acknowledge you. Um, I can't tell you how much you've had an influence in terms of my, my thinking uh, and my, me being the architect who I am today. So thank you if you're out there. I'm going to share my screen um, and just start now. Let me just see. It says, uh, um, may I also um, acknowledge uh, Nadir um, uh, in particular for, for holding a very complex space, uh, for making space for for me to be um, involved um, in the school and to and to engage so thank you Nader in particular let me just get the slideshow 
beginning to land. Great. Can everybody see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So here we go. Protagonist. Uh, experiments and practice agonistic engagement. So I do believe that that architecture is a form of agonistic engagement, which is um, one is it's an internal one. So it's about struggling with, you know, my own desires and my own beliefs and my own inadequacies in terms of a design problem. But I also think it's about engaging with society out there in its, in its myriad sort of levels. And that a protagonistic engagement comes about really through trying to find fruitful engagement through contestation of the status quo. And I deliberately use the word contestation because I think as a, a young person of color um, in a field that has historically not been um, as inclusive as we would like, um, the challenges of being effective in this space require some form of critical engagement that also doesn't diminish your voice um, in, these, in, the, in these conflicts and discussions. So from that perspective, um, agonism has been a way that I've begun to imagine practice and how I structured my life. My emblem is over the left hand of Southern Africa, partly because of the Blombos Caves in the Western Cape, where um, anthropologists have argued that the first signs of abstract um, thinking in human beings um, has been demonstrated um, uh, with particular rock art dating between 70,000 to 100,000 years ago. I particularly like this idea of the origin of abstract or graphic art, or let's say the first drawing uh, coming out of Africa. Uh, a cradle of humanity. But uh, more than that, I'm highly influenced by the constructivist movement and the avant-garde architectural movement um, of post-October uh, uh, Revolution Russia uh, from 1917 to 1922. And L. Lizitsky, um remains a, a quite an informative figure in the way that I imagine architecture as will be revealed. And there was a phrase that they used there which I thought was quite useful, which is uh, Levoya Kustvo, which basically is Russian for leftist art. And it's a bit of an appeal, not so much for a sort of utopian approach to architecture, but an appeal to, to dare to imagine a different reality and to create something different. This resonated very strongly with me when I was a student, as, as Haley mentioned in 1994, because we felt as if we were part of a generation of a new South Africa and accordingly a new generation of what African architecture could possibly be like, with all of the hubris that goes with such, uh, such a claim. So what exactly is agonistic politics? Um, I, I quote a good friend of mine, Edgar Peters, so he talks about how it's, you know, it's about radical democracy where we highlight and challenge the limits of the possible. Um, Paul Celius uh, refers to it as a sort of dissenting voices having no special privilege, but they have to enter into the agonistic of the network where their relevance is dynamically determined through competition and cooperation in terms of the history as well as the changing needs and goals of the system. For me, it's also about where architecture begins to grapple with private desires and that which is most public. And I'll reveal what that means shortly. So it's really about how does one engage in a context where, where uh, some of the perceptions about what architecture is, could be, or should not be, need to be recalibrated and, and reordered or, or, or questioned in the very least. The Vitruvian man is something that, is, that, that sits with all architects and also sits with me. Um, you know, he, these notions of firmness, commodity, and delight have been something that, that has underpinned my architecture work, but at the same time, I'm critical of it because I do believe it excludes other narratives which aren't necessarily about firmness or commodity. And also, delight remains highly subjective. But within that sort of framework of the way that Vitruvius imagine, imagines architecture, I also overlay um, other understandings which are important to me. L. Uh, Lizitsky's work, 1923, The New Man, um, was a, really a transformative piece of work as, as well as um, some of uh, Malevich's drawings. And this sort of superimposition that questions what is the nature of uh, the Renaissance, a Renaissance man, if, that, if such a term does exist, what, is, what does it mean to be African if there's anything that separates the notion of African from the rest of the planet or not? what holds these sorts of tropes or ideas together, but also in terms of being inspired by the constructivist movement, as well as the metabolist movement of the 1960s, where Japanese, young Japanese architects were trying to rebuild uh, 
uh, their country on the back of World War II and engaging with modernity and reestablishing different types of conversation about what does the uh, production of architecture mean from their cultural context. These are the things that have informed my, my practice to date. But there's another layer to it, which I think probably will land uh, the way that I approach architecture. I do believe that every architect um, should take the time at, at one level or not to try and articulate what is their positionality on what architecture is. Whether this becomes you know, a, a toward a new architecture in the sense of Le Corbusier, or it becomes 10 points or other sorts of elements, um, I think this becomes a sort of mandala for personal reflection. And this is the diagram that I produce for my work. I do believe in Heidegger's idea of dwelling in the fourfold. I don't necessarily aspire to a lot of Heidegger's values as an individual. I think his Nazi sympathies, um, sympathies, sympathetism is um, problematic. But I was always intrigued by this notion of dwelling in the fourfold, where architecture occupies a, a condition between God and mortality, earth and sky, where earth and sky are those conditions which are the physical constraints of architecture. So it's about tectonic structure, mass, weight, light, um, and performance, if you will. And God and mortality is where architecture, for me, begins to speak to the abstract and the symbolic, um, that which gives meaning to that which is physical. And I do believe that there's an inherent tension in terms of an architecture that seeks to dwell within the fourfold in a sort of Heideggerian sense. That inner circle that I've articulated there is what I would describe as my micro narrative. And this is where I sit as an individual. So that is me as Mukena Makeka, the person who likes Marvel, the person who liked watching Good Times as a kid, the person who you know likes cartoons, likes sci-fi, likes horror movies. That is the sort of personal narrative that should be inscripted into the architecture rather than being outscripted. But that has an implication because the imposition of my personal desires on the public is, is where I think architecture becomes quite complex. And that, that for me is, is politics, uh, not politics with a big P, but politics with a small B, which is the politics of the person and the politics of design. And outside of that, we have architecture, neighborhood, city, nation, state, and region. So that the moment we take our personal politics into the architectural realm, we should be aware that it has an implication at the architectural scale, the neighborhood scale, the city scale, nation state, and the region. But within that context, we also have what I call meta narratives or meta identities. These are ideas that are larger than myself. Uh, they could be about religion, they could be national identities, they could be pan-African identities. And when I engage with an architectural project, I'm quite careful to understand what is the meta narrative of the identity of the project that I'm engaged with, its community, and also what are my meta narratives and what is the intersection between the two. And the last component which feeds into this diagram is what I refer to as symbolic sites. Uh, the philosopher El Zahari from Morocco spoke about uh, symbolic sites of, of meaning. And he said that we as human beings, we, we navigate through cities and spaces, both through practical spaces that we enjoy and live in, let's say it's our home or our place of work, and then symbolic sites which connect us to deeper sorts of ideas. And these could be religious, these could be around memory, uh, these could be around other sorts of identities. So when we as architects are producing architecture in the public domain, if we are aware of the symbolic sites that exist for other people, if we are aware of the politics that exist beyond the architectural frame, and that the site itself can be larger than the building, but the site can actually be a whole city, and if you're aware of the sort of meta narratives that tie us in together, then there's a potential to find you know, architectural entry points. In my experience coming, coming from South Africa, these meta narratives included issues of you know, breaking down apartheid, not, not as a legal format, but the mentality that, that somehow progress and intellectual capacity has racial uh, you know, uh, boundaries. So that was a meta narrative that underpinned you know, a lot of my work as a student. This question of what does it mean to be African uh, in a country which historically has struggled with its connection with the rest of the continent. That was another meta narrative that's also important. But also the notion of what does architecture mean when historically it had been deployed by powers that were not necessarily thinking um, with the, the best of intentions for all of society. We have what are called apartheid cities and apartheid architecture, where all of the sort of modernist and universal ideas that one would associate with modern architecture were subverted in order to uh, you know, reproduce a particularly racially defined utopia. So that was also my own struggle about, you know, the act of architecture itself. Do I feel included um, in this pantheon of creativity? 
And for me, it's about understanding the oscillation between the self, uh, the other, uh, personal narrative, this bigger micro narrative, and all of that stuff underpins when I draw, how I draw, and what I think about before I draw. So as much as morphology and climate and context and you know assembly are all of the sort of tools of trade for an architect, which I do deploy as, as I hope I'll show, um, I do have a very personal understanding of what I think I need to do in order to answer questions which are not normally raised in an architectural frame. So that is the, uh, the country that, that I call home, uh, very far from yourselves um, at present, those of you who are um, in New York and elsewhere. South Africa in, in uh, 2016 surpassed Brazil as the world's most unequal country. It's one of many titles that we're not proud to have. And this inequality is partly an expression of the historical background of, of our country, uh, the inability of neoliberal economics to be able to bridge the gaps uh, in terms of how the economy is currently structured, um, and at the same time, uh, a global condition in which countries are increasingly competing. Um, it's very aggressive and various things such as um, an imbalance of skills and resources in certain sectors have meant that um, despite all of our best efforts since 1994, and indeed we have made great strides in terms of arresting a lot of the, uh, these um, data points, if you will, around inequality, we're still not there yet. And this is something that, that occupies my mind all the time. Cape Town is often seen as probably the most unequal city in, uh, in South Africa, uh, rightly or wrongly so, uh, that's debatable. But that also puts a certain burden that if I'm in, in the most unequal city in the most unequal country in the world, what does that mean for uh, my mode of production, what architecture is? By all accounts, my city is pretty um, attractive and easy on the eye. By all accounts, my city is difficult, painful, and, and confronted by tragedy on an almost uh, daily basis, whether it's regard to violence against women, whether it's uh, with regards to um, ongoing economic violence, if you will, whether it's with regards to the fact that our townships and informal settlements continue to endure and self-perpetuate and, um, and government seems to be unable or incapable to imagine a horizon where these informal areas uh, take on a very different uh, complexion. But my other concern, uh, going back to this point about the meta narrative, is about us as humanity. Um, with Greta uh, Thunberg recently uh, raising our attention around sustainability, not a new thing, but I think she put a very particular spotlight on it. Um, also with uh, the recent awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize with regards to food security. The reality is that as a species, we're headed towards a, a, a sort of um, species cliff, if we're not careful. Uh, the proportion of squatters out of a billion, a squatter basically being someone who's basically unable to, to have access to the type of resources and infrastructure that, you, that, that, that um, wealthy people have. There's one out of six billion in 2003. Uh, two out of 8.3 by 2030, and by 2050, 3.5 billion people uh, will be um, effectively squatters, uh, for lack of a better phrase. This has huge implications for what architecture needs to look like. It has huge implications for what cities need to be, how cities need to structure themselves, and has huge implications for education. So historically, the notion of architecture as really responding to a 1% um, uh, portion of society or elite or patronage, if you will, um, it will be an untenable. I think it already is in many instances. And the, it, has, it raises huge ethical questions for how much resources are invested in us as thinkers of the built environment. And then how do we reinvest that, uh, those, the, the, that knowledge, if you will, in terms of society? I don't have an answer to this point. It's merely another data point about the importance of architecture in cities. Uh, and that dialogue needs to be stronger and stronger um, over time rather than less and less. In Africa, um, we have an increasing number of, or basically a uh, population explosion, like most parts of the, of the global south. Uh, this is a diagram that I produced last year for an exhibit I curated at uh, the Africa Center in New York. We were beginning to demonstrate you know, the, the, the growth between 2019 and 2035 of the youngest continent in terms of um, people below the age of 30, um, as well as people below the age of uh, 22. Um, huge implications for job creation for property markets moving into the future, um, for entrepreneurial development and the importance of integrated economic strategies and huge implications for how do we begin to provide housing given that there'll be these huge demographic changes happening uh, in the upcoming period. 
But I do want to make a couple of points one, before I get into the, the architectural design is that the, the future will not be the image on the left hand side where it's all driverless cars and ubiquitous technology. I think that future is predicated on even higher degrees of inequality, um, whether it's within society or between nations. I think the image on the right hand side by the Afrofuturist Olalek and Jefu um, interests me because I think it speaks to what we're already seeing in many parts of the world. Uh, cities which are a combination of expertise and found materials, cities which are contingent, cities which are, are agile, cities where governance is not necessarily centralized, cities where maybe the tax base is zero. So um, cities have to reimagine how do they create public infrastructure. I would make the argument that this is the reality for at least uh, a quarter of the world's citizens and will probably increase over the next, in upcoming period. So what does this mean for aesthetics? What does this mean for morphology? What does this mean for how do we measure what is good or bad architecture in these conditions when the world is moving underneath our feet? I argue that uh, we need to spend much more effort understanding our context in order to understand what architecture needs to be. Uh, whereas too often we dwell so much on architecture at the expense of understanding that our context has changed. Um, however, some of us, and there's many giants who, who, who were at the forefront of this or were at the forefront of this, um, Libius Woods remains one of my, my favorite architects. Um, his drawings, which kind of spoke to a sort of messy architecture or a messy cityness, uh, post-decay, assemblage, found materials, uh, formal, uh, formal, formal clarity, but also a sort of incomplete uh, nature, if you will, is something that struck me. Um, now, not that Libius Woods was trying to channel what's required for African cities. I'm by no means implying that. What I would merely say is that when I look at his work and the work of others, this notion of a contingent city is something that, that I find quite compelling and quite attractive. And it also speaks to what I call an anticipatory architecture. And I'll explain what that means just now, because that is pretty much how I work, where the, the architectural act is about uh, creating uh, puzzle pieces for others to plug in and complete the picture. It's not about the complete uh, oeuvre or work in which the architect controls everything. Very often, a lot of my work is about acknowledging and accentuate that which I cannot control uh, so that I really focus on what I can control as opposed to controlling all components of the design. But these inequalities that, that, um, that, that express themselves, and this is um, a shot of a, a golf course in Durban by um, the same photographer on the cover of Time magazine, uh, Johnny Miller, a Cape Tonian uh, photographer, uh, they do remain with us. And part of this image captures the sort of inconsistencies, if you will, and, and complexities of the current modern condition in that the informal is an outcome of the formal, that it's almost difficult to separate the two and that in order for the formal to exist, it bizarrely has to produce an informal. Now, what do I mean by that? Is that the current ways that we imagine cities and structures and so on is that we are only exacerbating inequality and we do require a different imaginary where the intersections between what is informal and formal become more productive, become more interlinked and less problematic. But it will challenge our sense of aesthetics and sense of place and time. This is an image taken from Black Panther. I love this movie for a whole host of personal reasons, um, as, as well as architectural and academic reasons. I remember having a chat with someone who asked to watch the movie. who said it was preposterous because they said, well, in the future, why would you have cattle and thatch? Why isn't everything modern? You know, Black Panther doesn't make sense. And I try to explain that it's in that sort of in-betweenness that it does begin to make sense. This reminds me of Olalekan's work, where the future is a place where, um, you know, aesthetic perfection or aesthetic control will probably not be within our means. But the city of the future will begin to provide infrastructure to people, as many people as possible, with as many adjacencies as possible. And the city of the future will not be a place designed in a sort of master planning approach. But I think it will be eclectic. I think it will be uh, challenging in terms of our inherent desire for control, whether we're urban planners or architects. I think the city of the future will be um, a reflection of increased distribution of powers rather than increased concentrations of, of, of powers. And these contradictions are already happening right now. The image on the left-hand side is a, a, a cattle herder 
um, in Kenya who is using you know a smart mobile device to engage and to interact. And in fact, they even apps now where farmers are able to find out you know where's the best grazing land. So when these devices were being imagined, the conception was not that um, I imagine that a farmer in deep of Africa would be using it. The 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 marketing material probably would show somebody using that phone in a high rise, uh, you know, at the foot of a high rise building, etc. So the tech, what's happening in Africa now is what we call the leapfrog principle, which is the confluence of new technologies intersected with the past, producing different types of urban adjacencies that are unfamiliar. The image on the right hand side is a Ugandan entrepreneur who's uh, one of the world leaders in terms of using drone technology. And likewise, Rwanda right now is at the cutting edge of, of using drone technology to deliver medicine. And the entrepreneur was unable to execute that in the United States. So sometimes these sort of slippages, these sort of uh, gaps in governance actually allow for different types of opportunities to emerge. The question is, what is, what is the architectural equivalent that allows us to straddle the fourth industrial revolution, the, the third and the second, in a way that allows us to produce architecture and uh, in a different way and to engage with the needs of humanity in a, in a much more meaningful perspective. So all of those slides were kind of to give you a taste of what goes on in my mind with all of its inherent contradictions when, when I design. Uh, I will now take you through a number of experiments in, in different sorts of scales, uh, engaging with these sorts of ideas. Uh, when the World Cup came to our country or when it was announced, uh, I believe it was in 2006, 2007, it was a huge moment for the country. Um, this was also part of that post-1994 narrative where we wanted to show to the world that we are able to be modern and capable and able to produce um, um, events and so on. Lots of debate about whether it was appropriate or not. I'm not really here for that at this particular moment. But I was asked to design a trophy for the man of the match. And uh, Budweiser was the sponsor. And the idea was that at the end of each match, there would be a, a trophy that would be given which was great. I was one of five people selected, only one architect, the other four were industrial designers. And um, so you know, amazing opportunity, not only just to create an object, but actually to engage with bigger questions about you know, the whole world gazing upon South Africa and what would the South African trophy uh, look like. So you know, a quick analysis uh, for me revealed you know, that there's a, it tends to be a sort of a consistency aside from the world wreath in terms of our conception of what is trophy. There's an archetype or a typology. Um, where it is you know, symmetrical um, in one form or another, engage with the idea of an urn or a chalice. Um, it is a solid object. Um, and I decided that, well, you know, the first thing I'm going to do, going back to that diagram I described about you know, self in the meta narrative is that I needed to inject my own understanding of what this trophy could be. Understanding the meta narrative is, you know, what is Africa's take on the trophy? Is it just a different interpretation of a trophy or could there be a, a different sort of uh, reality to it? And some of you may not know this, but there's a sort of phrase um, in, in most of Southern Africa um, from, from Kenya all the way down to, 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 to Cape Town at least amongst indigenous Africans, which is Mutuki uh, Mutukabatu or to put it, that's in Sesotho, um, which is one of the languages. To put it bluntly, basically, I am through others. So in other words, I find my humanity through my role in a community. It's very different to other cultural philosophies, which is, you know, I think, therefore, I am, um, in terms of Descartes, so where that's about individual agency that can stand alone and therefore, you know, gives one purpose um, um, in many, um, in many of, the, of the cultures of sub-Saharan Africa, the argument is that I am because of others. So beadwork, for me, became an interesting metaphor and entry point because a bead is like an individual, but when a bead is aggregated, to form a pattern, then the individual actually, you know, contributes to a bigger meaning and to a bigger whole. So as opposed to having uh, an approach that is centered on the individual, I said, I wanted this um, trophy to feel like an assemblage of beads, an assemblage of, per of persons. It's a bit of a metaphor. And um, uh, tongue in cheek, but also quite deliberately, I do believe in circular economy and sustainability. One of the, the, the things that came out was that, um, not came out, uh, my concern was with uh, the amount of drinking that would have happened around uh, the World Cup. So I decided to recycle the bottles um, in terms of actually making the trophy itself. So grinding down the bottles to create these sort of amber beads, uh, taking the caps to actually form a sort of um, aluminum sheet, bending that, creating a mesh, creating a metallic web, glass beads, and then 
making sure that the sculpture was actually three dimensional um, in the sense that um, from all different perspectives, it, 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 was, it had a different aspect, um, if you will. And the modeling of that actual unit of, of the trophy, there are 32 games, so I made it 320 millimeters high, um, adjusted its volume so that the weight of it would not be heavier than the Juliette Romet trophy, which is the main one for the World Cup, and essentially uh, proposed a different type of trophy, if you will, one that gave when you squeezed it, it had a bit of push and pull, um, that was somewhat dynamic, that metaphorically spoke to this notion of beadwork and, and connection, uh, rather than a sort of solid, sort of symmetrical object. And that is what we produced. The reason I share the story um, um, with you all is that, you know, I was told that I got second in this competition. And the reason that I got second was because it was felt that my design wasn't African enough. And I, quite, I was quite intrigued by that proposition that, that the, the, the Budweiser judging team felt that, it was, that I did not know what was African. But again, that goes to some of these sort of micro challenges and microaggressions around what is deemed to be appropriate by either the people engaging with architecture or engaging with Africa or engaging with uh, the, the creative act in and of itself. Um, but I also show this project because I would not have been able to arrive at this position had I not interrogated my personal politics around attempting to do something different, understanding the meta narrative of the gaze that's on South Africa, whether it's in terms of the stadium or the event or et cetera, and that it's, it's, it's quite important to be part of this new dialogue. And I do tend to channel that sort of constructivist idea about you know, reassemblage, reinvention, and is there a way to reinterpret what is currently existing to make new, new architectures and new designs? The next project that I will show and there might be some resonance um, with, with some of the audience. Um, the police, um, I, I would argue, are a troubled institution globally. Uh, we've seen what has happened recently in, in the United States over the last year uh, with police brutality and so on. And when I received this commission to design a police station, I, I had my own um, anger, fear, uh, mistrust of my client, not as an individual, but as an institution. What does it mean to design a police station? Um, in South Africa, the, the police were for a long time quite an active part of, of, the, of, of the will of the state. Uh, so this wasn't a, a state where the police were there to protect. They were literally there to conserve and, and to control, which is a very different uh, mentality. And um, the, 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 the particular uh, police team that I, that I had to or rather police component that I had to work with was the railway police, which I'll explain just now. But what struck me in engaging with the police was this notion that even though the laws of apartheid might fall away, the sort of institutional um, problematique, if you will, of power and control continue to, to, to be pervasive. So here's an image of police actually, you know, manhandling um, um, uh, you know, other Africans in South Africa. So we also have a xenophobia challenge, by the way. So I by no means want to give the impression that South, Africans, South Africa's challenges are only on a racial level. Um, there are tiers of, of conflict and tiers of misunderstanding that need to be engaged in and with. So the railway police were particularly involved with regards to um, various atrocities. Uh, they were actually disbanded in 1986 after evidence showed that they were involved in what was called third force activities. This is where the government was actually funding um, certain parts of the police to torture and to do um, uh, a number of sort of heinous acts. And I, I received this commission partly because the state, sorry, rather that the railway agency had lost a court case and they were told by the, by the high court that they have to provide safety for commuters. Um, so they decided to reinstall one of this most troubled railway police um, um, units. The police station that I'm going to show you, and there it's highlighted there on, on the map, um, has a sort of uh, panopticon relationship to a taxi rank and a uh, what's retreat a train station at the bottom. So it sits there overseeing um, uh, the interchange. So that taxi rank is essentially where um, commuters would come in, get onto the trains and come into town. And the location of the police station was to oversee these activities and it's part of a sort of nodal strategy uh, for, for providing security. The strategy of the building, and, and mind you, by the way, th these are not projects with excessive amounts of capital um, and opportunity for gymnastics. These are very, very tight, uh, tight budgets, uh, narrow understandings of what the brief needs to be. And I think I'll explain to you some key points 
which will then explain the architectural strategy. The, the commissioner told me that the windows had to be very narrow so that you could shoot out and, you know, if there were rioters, nobody could shoot back in. Uh, they wanted uh, you know, steel gates everywhere. They wanted um, high uh, palisade fences that could prevent people from coming in. Um, the building needed to be internal, almost a sort of cloistered courtyard with no um, interfacing with the context. And one of the things that was most striking in conversation with the police commissioner was that she had um, pretty much lost faith in her own staff um, in the sense that um, when I spoke about architecture as an ennobling act or a humanist act, I'm, I'm in one meeting, she literally said to me, no, but the animals, they're all violent. You know, there's, you shouldn't be giving them nice things. Don't, don't specify good door handles. They're going to destroy them. Don't specify good taps in the bathroom. They're going to vandalize them. And I said to her, you know, if you treat um, anyone uh, as, as if they're subhuman beings, um, don't be surprised if they don't behave in, in that way. So the whole arch architectural strategy was about subverting that impression and actually looking at the, the building as an opportunity to ennoble uh, the act of policing and, and the police staff. So what basic gestures, but which were actually quite fundamental at a phenomenological level was, you know, the removal of a fence from the front of the building along this portion over here. I argued that ordinary people should be able to come right up, up to the building. Um, in terms of the windows, and you'll see in the elevation right now, they are large and square. You can look right into it. I placed all of the police officers on the front section looking out onto the space before they wanted to be on the inside with all of the cadets on the outer edge, creating a sort of buffer zone. So I flipped that in the diagram. The notion that um, there would be a series of thresholds that take you through the space. So this is a sort of freestanding floating wall that you penetrate through. There's a sort of court, uh, internal courtyard, if you will, uh, where, you, where you fill out your, your documents, a screen at the back end, and then another series of spaces at the back. So it's a sort of enfilade or unfolding space um, with views right through the building at the main section of the foyer. And then looking at the sort of you know, Roman idea of the card of the Decomanus as a, a cross axis, um, you can see here that along this long axis, this, this sort of internal street uh, that I had imagined as a sort of public realm for the police staff. This is a line of control. This would be seen as one building, another building, another building, another building, with a sort of interstitial joint right in the middle. So it was all about being, in my instance, quite careful about what do these different components do and how do they assemble themselves. On the corner, um, uh, I proposed a literally a barbecue space and a smoking corner, and the commissioner asked me why. And um, I, I, I had done some research and um, what I found is that A, there wasn't enough resources for the police to be given what are called de-stressing spaces after work. So you can imagine you get up at 9 a.m., um, you see the most horrendous things throughout the day, you go home at five, six o'clock, and um, there's sometimes high levels of domestic violence from police persons. And I made, I made the point that architecturally, the building has to allow for a decompression space before they go back to their families. And that needs to be, in some respects, a sort of secure sort of public courtyard. And they subscribe to that. And I think what was interesting about that conceptually was that the brief as given to me had to be changed in order to accommodate that because the police persons had never considered that as part of the architectural proposition. Um, here's a, a section to the building. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry, let me go back there. Um, very, very modest, free, but, but I do work a lot with light as will become clear in the presentations as other projects go. So there's a freestanding wall, which, which almost presents a sort of um, gate, if you will, but that's not controlled, but it's a sort of metaphysical gate, a sort of screening device using fil filigree at the top so that there's dappled light coming down. The clear story glazing at the top is milky, which gives a sort of washed light, and it creates a sort of larger internal volume, and this is essentially the counter where one would um, engage with the police officer and, and fill out your forms. This line over here is the line at which the police actually enter into the, the core of their building. And I decided to exaggerate the depth of the gutter to create a, a, a what I call a compressed condition. Um, um, in, in many traditional African homes, um, what would happen is that the entrance is actually quite low uh, because it's a metaphysical statement that when you enter into the house, you need to bow down to enter into the home. And it's about making sure that you appreciate the transition between being inside and outside. So for me, I wanted to make sure that this would be the public realm of ordinary people coming to engage. But once a police person comes in, that they experience a space of compression, a vertical space of explosion, which is that internal street that I spoke about, 
and then the subspaces at the back end. And when the, the commissioner asked me, why would I do that? I said, she has to imagine that this building is almost like putting a uniform on in the morning. That a, when, once you put on the uniform or the badge and you become the police person, I wanted the architecture to have the same equivalent effect that once you came to work and you reported for work, that the architecture itself should prepare you for work. And it was understanding these different light conditions, the threshold, the openness, the compression, the internal street, and then the more cellular spaces at the back end. It's, there's really not much to it. It's not that complicated a, a section and not really too much gymnastics. I couldn't really modulate the ground plane. So all I could adjust was you know, the way that the roofs work. And I was also quite careful to make sure that this internal street is not visible to the outside. So in other words, I wanted this internal public realm to feel like a sort of private space that only the police knew about, but was not visibly uh, visible to, to the outside. The elevations are here. Oh, uh, important things about material. I was told I need to use dark brick um, because there would be no need to clean the building. There's no money for maintenance. So I decided to make the building white so that they would have to find money to maintain it. Um, they wanted burglar bars on the windows. And I said, that's, that projects fear. And I said, I'm not going to create a fearful building because the police have to project confidence, not fear. So I redesigned the window mullions so that all of the burglar bars are on the inside of the windows. So it's not visible from the street. You can see there, there's no fence. There's this sort of framing device, but also this idea of, of how do you break up space um, when you don't have much, you know, so, so every meter counts, every couple of centimeters. And it's all about understanding for me it was all about understanding what can i do with the spatial experience the tectonic experience and the color experience of this building to effectively help make police do their jobs better which actually was my fundamental concern in the beginning because of my my the bias that i had in the beginning and my antipathy that i had towards the police so i also had to go through my own personal transformation in terms of producing the architecture um, here are some photos of it that's a shot of that internal street um, you know, fun fact, um, South Africa is a place where we don't have good indigenous timber. Uh, we, we're, Southern Africa is largely savanna, so we don't really have good woods. Uh, this is pine, probably the cheapest pine that you can actually get. I battled so hard to tint it to make it look way much better <laughs> than it needs to look. Um, I remember rejecting 30% of the timber pieces for warping on site. Um, you know, it, it worked out well, but... Uh, uh, there were a lot of things that we had to do in order to get this to to work what it is and and again it's 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 just a police station at at a, at a, at a certain level there's the smokers corner um, an opportunity to look out to look in um, a lot of a lot of the work that i that i do um, or i attempt to do is really about understanding how simplicity can have a an impact on people there are moments when the architecture has has flourishes but I think this, this project was very much about really engaging with this problematic of, of the police. And that's a shot there. So a couple of other interesting things, um, you know, I'm not saying that the architecture had a direct relationship to crime reduction. Obviously a new police station should help crime reduction, but um, they contacted me three months afterwards. They told me the building is doing great. Nobody's vandalized it. Nobody's attacked it. Nobody's, you know, there's, you know, and it's been up for now 10 years. There's been no need to put up a palisade fence um, at all. Um, and, and in fact, uh, the, the commissioner was telling me that the police persons try and get themselves deployed um, uh, there, yeah, you know, because you get a choice of where you can sometimes go, uh, simply because they said that the, the building makes them feel good, which is like maybe a very minor thing, but I do believe that, that happiness is an important subtext of, of, of I think, a, a, a hopeful architecture, right? So for me, I was quite happy about that, that proposition. Different project entirely. Um, here I am, I'm in London, um, co-designing a, a proposal for a stadium in, in South Africa, also part of the World Cup. Um, I, I missed my meeting in, in London because my, my passport was damaged. So I was supposed to be designing the facility with uh, Peter Cook, he's seated over there. Um, he was actually consulting with um, HOK. So when I arrived, I, 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 like, this is one of Peter Cook's work, by the way, for those of you who may not know, I'm sure you do. When I arrived, I was told that the architectural concept for the stadium was the Basuto hat. 
Now, the Basuta hat is inspired by the specific mountain in Lesotho. You can see it there. And, you know, as, a, as an indigenous Musuto, I was very excited, but I was also kind of appalled because I said there's no relationship whatsoever between a Basuto hat and the Western Cape um, where the stadium is going to be. So, you know, we now had to redesign this, uh, this stadium very, very quickly. And I came up with a number of uh, solutions and ideas with the colleagues there. And, and one is that we, we started to critique this question of symbols and iconography. And, um, and in the case of South Africa, we, we have 12, um, 12 official languages, uh, a number of subcultures, and we're still a country in becoming. So we have very few unifying figures, if we're very honest, aside from maybe Nelson Mandela and the Big Five. So what that, what that meant was that in terms of, you know, how can an architecture begin to capture this ideal? I put this slide together just to kind of demonstrate at the time the, the sort of thinking that was in mind. The one is that um, Cape Town is one of, or rather the Cape is one of uh, the seven floristic kingdoms, which means it has a high density of, of, of biodiversity in terms of um, flora. Um, showing the, the Sydney Opera House in terms of how a city can, or indeed a country can, can you know, find a new identity, if you will, um, by architecture, same as with the uh, Statue of Liberty. But also we have the national flower being the Protea. On the top right hand side is, is Table Mountain, the city that we reside in, but this view is taken from Robben Island, uh, which is where not only Nelson Mandela was incarcerated, but Robben Island has been a prison of sorts, um, pretty much going back until the late 1600s, where various successive um, uh, indigenous leaders were incarcerated by the colonial regime. So I was quite intrigued by the question of, okay, if these are the sort of things that one needs to think about, how does one um, bring that unifying figure of Nelson Mandela and Robben Island into the conversation? The stadium its site it's, itself is uh, quite interesting from a historical perspective. Uh, it's in a part of the town called uh, um, Sea Point. You can see there's a golf course over there, um, uh, somewhat gentrified. Um, this is, uh, you know, and, but I decided to analyze the site, understanding the sport elements, park edge definition, water bodies, um, working with the team quite closely on this, understanding how do we, you know, uh, map and tame the site. And there were some interesting things that, uh, that came out in terms of the research on the site. One, one was that it was actually one of the sites where um, the concentration camps, uh, the, in terms of the Anglo-Boer War, it was one of the sites where um, Africana prisoners were, were put down, as well as um, indigenous Africans were also held in prison. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, what was also interesting about the site was the fact that there was a hundred year old informal market that happened there every Sunday. And those of you who may have worked with the World Cup, uh, these, these events and mega events tend to sterilize uh, local economic opportunity and local players. So my big concern was, you know, how do we ensure that this new stadium doesn't sterilize um, other sorts of livelihoods just because of a spectacle for, let's say, two to three weeks, even though, of course, the infrastructure spin-offs uh, would be there for a generation plus. The red line indicates an axis that I said I wanted to connect to Robben Island. So I did something which hadn't been done before, which is to take the typical oval of the stadium and literally to pull it apart so that there was a gash in the building. So kind of, you know, subverting the, the, the panopticon idea of, of, a, of a sort of stadium, if you will, and actually saying that it needed to be connected to contact. So it was connecting between Table Mountain um, and, and, and Robben Island. The architectural metaphors that were quite important, again, um, there's a different interpretation of the beadwork, but it's this notion of assembly, of crafting, of, of weaving, of basket making, um, connecting mountain sky to sea, and then looking at the form of the, the protea and, and the sort of rolling landscapes in terms of interior of the country and overlaying this together. And, and what it allowed us to do was, was to kind of reframe what this stadium could look like. Obviously, there's, there's the functionality of seating and media workspace, et cetera, that we had to do. Uh, there's this sort of uh, diagram in terms of you know, how the site was structured. And then what we did was really propose that this, this stadium would do one of two things. One is that the space underneath the raked seating would remain as a sort of um, informal market. That informal market would still be allowed to continue to perpetuate out into the landscape. So it was a bit of a, a, a social gesture or a socialist gesture, if you will, where you have these dramatic um, you know, uh, titanium leaves wrapping up and over um, in quite a sort of delicate way. Um, it um, wrapping over the sort of base, which has the, the sort of 
timber filigree slatted, but this this notion of a sort of new new um, uh, public platform and a new way of engaging. So as opposed to having a stadium which is all about the interior condition and nothing about the outside space per se, it's all about the internal spectacle. This stadium was about the internal spectacle as well as the, in, the external spectacle um, overlapping, and that was the gash that that I that I proposed in the building. Um, Fun fact, you know, we had lots of discussions around the economic modeling because, you know, if you lose those number of seats, the, you have to actually allocate them elsewhere so that you maintain your capacity, but also there's a cost uh, value proposition to where seats are in relation to sight lines. So there was a lot of science that we had to get into with, with the amazing team at HOK about how do you actually modulate these, these types of gestures. And and the idea was also that the, the landscape would come up and meet it, that it would be submerged, that it would be uh, very much a sort of ephemeral structure, you know, as opposed to these sort of more traditional sort of um, stadium operations. And that, that was the view that we produced there. And what I really liked about it, although we didn't win this one also, was, you know, this, this sort of confluence, if you will, between being inspired by the things which are of this place, taking new technology which is of not this place, but then also understanding micro needs on the ground, such as this hundred year old market that I could not imagine or fathom drawing a building knowing that it would displace them. So that was one of the, the key driving um, metaphors, if you will, for the strategy behind the stadium. And that was the, the, the plan that I sketched up. Not so happy with this 3D render. I wasn't really happy with that representation, but that gives you a sense of what it possibly could have looked like. The next project, uh, Tusong Service Center, excuse the spelling. Tusong means a place, a place of help. I've described to you that Cape Town is a place that is highly unequal. These are scenes from my city. They often between 12 and 14 kilometers apart, extreme wealth and extreme poverty. This image of this child over here, um, always, I always use it in my presentations because it kind of inspires me about what, what we can do as, as architects, that, you know, that anybody can be a Superman. But the site of Kailicha, which is a, an informal township in Cape Town, um, uh, the largest one, um, estimates are anywhere between one and, and two million uh, people. Um, census, census seem to vary on it. Um, it suffers from you know, two annual, or rather, or rather sort of a biannual crisis. One is you know, uh, periodic uh, flooding that is seasonal, um, as well as fires, which raise down these um, informal shacks. And, being in these sort of informal um, areas means that your, your sense of precarity is quite high because at any moment your goods may be lost. And these are, these are natural phenomena, uh, or natural at least in terms of perhaps man-made, but natural phenomena, let alone the sort of safety issues at a person-to-person -person level. So when I was asked to intervene here and to put up a community center, which would have served to really do two things. One was to help uh, provide essential services to the community, which was an important thing. But also the, the president at the time, Tabu Mbeki, wanted these community centers to be bridges between different racial communities. So Kailicha is close to Mitchell's Plain, which is what we call in South Africa a colored or a mixed race community. And Kailicha would be largely seen as a sort of uh, indigenous African community. Um, again, please accept that all of these categories uh, are problematic even in South Africa. You know, we, we struggle to find the right words to capture these issues. So the Two Song Service Center had a, had a sort of political dimension and ambition as well as an on the ground uh, dimension and ambition. The site uh, had no um, urban design framework. I mentioned this point about working in an anticipatory fashion. Um, I had to literally imagine an urban grid on the site, imagine where the roads would be. There was money to put up a building, but there was no money to actually put up the roads, uh, which was, I couldn't wrap my mind in terms of how you know, government allocates funds and so on. But be that as it may, I was, I was intrigued by what this community center could do for the people. And how do I deal with this question of precarity, which I thought was the, the, the primary architectural challenge, not, not, the, not the brief. The brief is one thing, but this, this, this question of precarity. And what I wanted to do with the building, there's the plan there, was to create an architecture that was oversized. Um, if you think of um, Michelangelo's uh, giant columns, or, where, or let's say the, the Pantheon, where where structure uh, becomes architecture. I was really intrigued by these sorts of ideas and as well as how does one modulate light in the architecture. These are some sections, but I'll quickly jump to, to some of the photos. Here's an interior shot of the space. And there are a couple of things that are happening there. 
The columns are larger than they need to be because I wanted to give a sense that this building would not burn down in the event of a fire. I wanted to give a sense that this building would not wash away if there was a flood. Now, the client did not articulate this to me uh, as a sort of brief, but I wanted an architecture that gave a sense of belonging to a community that has often been displaced, relocated, moved around, um, and, and does not have a, a sense of rootedness. Now, we could debate about whether it's appropriate to make people in informal settlements feel that they are rooted there, but it was really more about saying that the state needs to invest properly in architecture because architecture is where people, um, public architecture that is, is the place where often people play out their, their public expressions. If you're living in a small house or a shack, you often don't have access to these type of spaces. So these become the living rooms of people in these communities and therefore they are deserving of even more investment. Uh, because of that, I managed to get the, the budget uh, doubled, which, which was fantastic. I managed to convince them about that. That Gabian wall at the back section um, is composed of table mountain sandstone. Um, the reason that I put that in is when I was engaging with community on the ground, some of them told me that they had never been to the city center because they felt the city center wasn't for them. Um, uh, so the city center was for white people and the wealthy people and Table Mountain belonged to them and black and poor people and brown people belong on the Cape Flats. So it's a bit of a metaphor. I decided, well, I will bring the mountain to the people. So I was quite insistent on having Table Mountain Sandstone brought in, even if it's a, just a sort of abstract psychosocial connection with, with, with Table Mountain. The other idea was that the whole facade would open up so that the interior space and the exterior space would, 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 would um, intermesh. So again, breaking down this notion of a closed off building. Um, you know, I had also very similar challenges where the client, you know, was insistent that the windows would be broken, uh, that the community doesn't understand or respect architecture. Um, and you'd be amazed that sometimes the client is probably the most resistant person to, to, to an architectural effort. But in this case, they were quite supportive. I managed to convince them otherwise. And likewise, the building never been demolished. Um, one of the first buildings to do off shutter concrete in the township, that might not sound like a big deal, but trust me, that was a bit of a big deal. Um, getting those finishes right, working with local contractors, um, skills transfer on site. But also you can see here, um, and I, it, it was bittersweet doing these photos of the building because there was no road to the building at the time. Uh, there, was no, there was no money for, for access. So creating these sort of alien projects, if you will, that land in the middle of the landscape, um, I struggle with that, but that's just the nature of our context. I ha you have to design, in some instances, in an anticipatory fashion, where you have to imagine that your building will give clues to what else needs to happen around you, and other budgets will be found for, for, for the project. Um, and that's another shot of it along that side there. I'm very well received by, by the community, and, um, you know, Obviously, the, the context is now filled in so by, by a number of other sorts of interventions, which, which um, I think need to be read on their, their own merit in terms of what they were attempting to do. But this, this was um, one of the projects that I really enjoyed, especially in terms of pushing boundaries of what architecture in a township um, needs to look like or be like. Because when the brief started, there was a very explicit, um, or rather implicit uh, statement that, you know, that when you work in these communities that you don't necessarily design with the same rigor or intent or architectural depth or strategy. These are some, inter some of the internal views. Uh, Leopard's Leap, and I'm just going to quickly skip over this one, uh, it, uh, merely to show, um, the sort of, I'm trying to also demonstrate the sort of variety of, of work that, that interests us. Uh, this project was interesting because the, the client um, uh, owns a wine brand, Leopard's Leap, and um, you know, very, very sweet guy. Uh, <laughs> but um, in, in the meeting, when we were discussing the brief, he, uh, this, this wine brand was meant to target uh, black people because black people historically don't drink wine, right? And he wanted to expand. So you know, in the meeting, he says to me, um, I want you to design a building for people like you to drink this drink. Now, that could be so offensive, right? <laughs> you know? Um, but actually, and, 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 you know, but there was, a, there, was a since, there was a sincerity there. And again, maybe language wasn't, wasn't, wasn't at hand. But this, this genuine curiosity about how do I make an architecture that can go beyond the narrow confines of, 
of his current constituency. And, and that really is why I'm sharing this project. So I always had this idea in my mind. And, and, and it was a weird statement, like, who am I? And you know, I don't even drink red wine, not that much. Haley would know, I'm a, I'm a tequila fan. But, um, but the, pro the project was also successful. I, I worked with uh, some artists in terms of some sculpture work here. This was the bar counter that I designed. So, you know, pushed some innovation in terms of woodworking with the local team. Um, and it's a, it's, a different, it's a different type of audience, very different to the work that I, I do in the township and so on. Uh, slightly different sort of sensibility. But, um, and yeah, and it, it, was, it, was a, it was a successful project. An existing building, by the way, uh, that I had to convert. So I just kept the roof and everything else was uh, entirely new and, and changed. I'm sure you can see leanings of Mies van der Rohe, one of, one of my heroes. He keeps creeping up in my sketches as much as I try to avoid him, but he's there. Um, and this is some of the furniture that, uh, that I designed. Ordos uh, project, and, and thanks Haley for kind of uh, mentioning it. The Ordos, the Ordos project was, was, was really a, a, a huge growth curve for me. Um, a, because you know, to be part of this, this group of 100 architects traveling to uh, Mongolia, um, Ordos Mongolia, engaging with Ai Weiwei, being selected by Herzog de Muran, being one of two architects from Africa. Um, and everybody kept asking me, what the architecture of Africa going to look like? What, you know, what type of architecture do you do over there? So this sort of strange burden, A, of trying to represent something that I cannot possibly represent in and of myself was, was the one thing. The second point to it was genuinely being curious about what does it mean to be in, in, uh, somebody of an African background working in orders, if that means anything, if at all. And, and what could I learn from the process? And what, what, what made the design uh, work or for me or what, or what, what my, let's say my pivot point was actually a conversation that I had with Ai Weiwei when he was talking about the destruction of the Hutongs, which is a particular um, uh, architectural housing typology in Beijing. And he said that all of these buildings are coming up and destroying um, uh, th these Hutongs, which are essentially a courtyard sort of um, structure. And what's interesting about the, the Hutong is that it's very different to the Western or even, let's say, some African conceptions of what is public and private space. Because the interior courtyard of the Hutong is actually a private space, but that is publicly accessible. So private activities play themselves out in the center of the Hutong as exposed to the outside. So I was really intrigued by this notion of semi-public, private, semi-public, private. So I decided to make a building in which the heart of the building actually becomes public. Um, so the, the, the strategy was about taking some of these, let's say, um, more traditional Chinese conceptions of, of, of the hierarchy of space, applying it, to, applying it to the diagram, producing an architecture that was in and of itself, but the way that it operated was around this sort of idea that disrupted uh, public and private in the way that we, we sequentially understand that you always move from, you know, from public to semi-public to differing degrees. You know. But this was a, an interesting inversion. And, and the gash, you can see it there, um, through the building connected that public realm across to that other space on that side. The residential spaces were on top. The bottom floor was treated as a sort of art uh, gallery. And it was really about a, a building where the street actually becomes into the building. Um, and we had a lot of fun. And that's, that's a, a shot of what that space is, some of the views. What I like about this project is that when I presented it at the end uh, to, to the client, um, he came to me afterwards and he said I was the only one out of the hundred people who actually spoke to him about Mongolian culture when I designed the building. Now, I'm not taking anything away from any of the other super, super talented schemes. I, I attended, I think, 19 of the presentations that were really, really amazing. But I think um, the projects had different entry points about what was the opportunity and what was the problem um, and what was the space, whereas I was very curious about learning about you know, Mongolian culture, if you will, and what would be a modern interpretation of their sort of primeval spatial understandings of, 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 of space, particularly around this notion of the, of, of, of the hutong, et cetera. And that was that. Unfortunately, this, this woman's head is covering my model. I've, I've searched the internet for, a, for an appropriate image, but I, I don't have it. But this is the, the exhibition that I would put together of all 100 schemes. Uh, an amazing project, an amazing opportunity to meet really amazing people. Um, and um, yeah, uh, really, really learned a lot.
Um, Cape Town Station. Haley, will you let me know when I've got about maybe 20 minutes left, just so I'm respectful of time? If that's so maybe okay. it's one ten. So maybe if you stop at one thirty, we can have thirty minutes discussion. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, good. So I'll go quite quickly. So um, Cecil John Rhodes uh, is was a for those of you who may not know was a an entrepreneur, uh, a, a businessman, a, a tycoon, um, on par with uh, Rockefeller, if not not greater. Um, had huge influence over, uh, you know most of East, you know, English speaking Africa. This was his idea of connecting Cape to, to Cairo with a railway line, uh, specifically from Cape Town Station and two countries named after him and so on. And, and um, I, I show this image because the project I'm about to show now, which is Cape Town Station, which I've worked on in two sort of iterations, um, was really sort of in the backdrop of this other sort of colonial idea that has kind of recycled itself on this, on this site. So the red dot indicates the site of Cape Town Station, which has gone through different uh, iterations. Um, there was a horse and carriage economy. Um, what, what I refer to as a sort of um, mineral economy, this was after the discovery of, of diamonds and golds in South Africa, that that, that, that meeting point began to play a different role. Uh, 1920, a uh, big pivot in 1965, when the, the, it was the, the end of steam and that station had to be converted to accommodate um, electricity. And I was asked to really transform this station and I was aware of all of these successive waves, as well as this imprint, if you will, of, of this bigger sort of narrative. This is a shot of the Victorian station. Um, this was demolished by uh, the apartheid government, I think in 1964, somewhere around there, 64, 66. I just have to check my dates. Um, and that was also a part of the expression because the apartheid regime was very clear about wanting to embrace the modern expression at the expense of Victorian architecture because of a sort of historic antipathy between Dutch and, and English. So if you travel to South Africa, it's, you'll find our institutional architecture prior to 1994 has a very particular um, architectural language on, on the whole. And it also, you, you, you see it in different places. Here's the, the, the founder, or rather the, the, the person who made the, the phrase apartheid famous, the lower figure over there is President Furfud. And um, he came to Cape Town Station when it was opened and said it was a shining example of apartheid planning. In fact, um, uh, you know, he, he used to speak glowingly about the genius of its segregation devices and how it makes sure that black and white people don't intersect and mix. Uh, bearing in mind that Cape Town as a city was also seen as a, a sort of example, if you will, of, of, of uh, the sort of uh, utopian uh, racially, um, racially ordered, ordered city. So when I was given the opportunity um, to, to do an intervention on Cape Town Station for 2010, um, I was aware of these different histories, the histories of Cecil John Rhodes, the histories of, of the Wood, and, and even more recent histories, uh, 1980s, um, um, people being beaten um, and, and running um, to, to the station. And when I worked on the project, there was even one room, which I promise you to this day, I'm convinced it was a torture chamber. It was the most bizarre, you know, dystopian uh, space I've ever ever come across. And when I asked the, the the station officials what was that space, they said they don't know, and I mustn't talk about it. So very very complex things. Cape Town Station, just to give you a bit of a zoom in in terms of where it's located in the in the city. Uh, this is a shot with the top section taken off, so you can see the tracks coming in here. Uh, this is the main concourse that abuts onto a large public square, which which was uh, effectively part of my scope. We have here the oldest um, architectural, or rather building in, in Southern Africa, which is the castle. I think that's from 1663, I'm not so sure I could be wrong, or at least remnants of it. Uh, the Grand Parade, which is where the, the soldiers would gather, but this is also where Nelson Mandela addressed the public um, when he was released from prison. This was the first place that he came to. And we have over here a series of large mega structures. This was all part of a sort of, um, uh, modernist ideal of, of large infrastructure buildings sitting in the core of the city um, and, and um, almost picking up on some of the ideas of the CIAM conference um, about the sort of international style, but obviously with a sort of uh, racial tint to it. The, the project that, that, that I found was as follows. One was a large public space in the front that was um, inaccessible, so not really public. Um, people were often uh, beaten in this space, all on the station. 60% of the crime in the central city um, was from, or believed to have emanated from this facility. So I had to sit in police debriefing meetings about 
all of the number of crimes that were on this project. So this wasn't just an architectural refurbishment. It actually ended up becoming a much bigger project. I had to engage with uh, uh, 362 informal traders, um, uh, run a public participation process with them. I helped shut down an, an, ab an illegal abortion clinic. Um, and so these things are not apparent in, in, in the imagery, but it's just to give you a sense of what happens with, with, with some of these infrastructures or architectures, if you will. And I deliberately proposed something that was perhaps beyond the reach of the client. Um, this notion of the idea of the train tracks coming out and weaving into the city. Um, we obviously, in, uh, what, what we call value engineering in South Africa happened, so materials changed and so on. But what was a bit of an achievement was this was an exercise in terms of what does one take away from the design. Sometimes architecture is about what you put in. Um, in many instances, this was about what do you, what do you subtract. The other point uh, that I think is important was that there was a strong impulse to demolish this building and start afresh, that the, the memories of this building were so uh, fraught, why don't you just get rid of it? But I, I was aware of the finances and the resources. I mean, uh, we just don't have the money to build. I mean, if there wasn't even enough money to do the paving properly, could you imagine what would have happened if I proposed demolishing the building? So there was also this sort of bigger meta-narrative of this desire, um, which was quite, quite strong to like, just get rid of the station because of all of its bad memories. And I had to kind of wrestle with my own personal desire and say, well, yes, I, emotionally I'd love to do that, but it's not the responsible thing to do. So I decided to work with the infrastructure, subtract, add when necessary. We're part of a team with a number of other um, architects and urban planners. And these are some shots, excuse the phrase, of, of how that space uh, became transformed over time, particularly with regards to the World Cup. And what was a space which before was a place of, of punishment, of you know, um, portable toilet blocks and you know, rats the length of your arm, um, suddenly became a different type of space. And then when we had the World Cup, um, Cape Town Station and the stadium, uh, this was the winning scheme, by the way, um, effectively had, had this sort of dynamic tension across the city where we had this fan mile where thousands of people filled the streets and literally walked and were able to, to, to carouse and engage. And this is an image of that square that I, that I did. And, um, and this was on the first New Year's Eve after I finished the building. And I think one of my proudest moments was, was seeing a space filled with, you know, 30, they told me it was like 35,000 people dancing, enjoying themselves, being in a space that one would never have associated with those type of emotions for hundreds of years. Being in a space which was associated with celebrating racial segregation and being in a space to see celebration and understanding that it was made possible not by adding lots of things, but made possible by actually taking away things. And that was a very um, important um, personal lesson for me as an architect that sometimes um, subtraction is greater than addition. Some um, shots of the interior space um, prior to, to the work. Um, this was the design that I proposed. So relocated traders, change the surfaces, change the material, um, open up the facade. And here are some images uh, just uh, not, not too recently, but um, about a year after it was opened, uh, a totally different condition, um, engagement with, with inside and outside. And it was about you know, trying to create a civic space where civic culture was, was actually absent and was actually, actually designed out of it. And, um, and here are some people from Uruguay coming in. Again, a moment that I was quite, quite happy about to see the building doing what it was meant to do, but also doing more than what it was meant to do from a social perspective. I'm gonna quickly flick through this project uh, very, very quickly, Haley. I was just asked to do um, an envisioning process with regards to Cape Town 2030, which is what, what are the type of refurbishments required to make Cape Town Station if you finish construction by 2030 to work until the year 2100. So another utopian exercise, we had to go through exercises around, you know, demographic change, modeling, climate change, um, potential shifts in technology, um, understanding how cities grow over time. And we just went through a series of exercises proposing that the railway, uh, to the train station would be sunken underground. Um, we demonstrated that if that was the case, it would unlock uh, a number of parcels of land in the surrounding area. Uh, allowing for potentially up to 110,000 people to move back into the city. So there was also this sort of architectural politics about making a more inclusive um, central city, which was part of, which was part of the brief. Um, what I did with the public space system is that it was an inversion. So I took the footprints of all of the old, um, you know, 
uh, colonial architecture. You can actually see that's the old fortress over there. And I made them the public spaces in the new diagram. So that there's also this, this intermingling between past, present, and future. Um, and it, it was you know, well, well received, but the, the project could never go ahead because of inherent tensions between the railway authority, which falls underneath a sort of national mandate and sort of local concerns, um, which is the, the city of Cape Town. And it's a real pity because uh, this project could have totally transformed the, at least the, the, the demographics of the city and allowed for affordable housing to, to come in. This is a shot of, sorry, just going back there, of the, the, the railway museum that I proposed once I had sunk in all of the, the concourses underground because the history of transport and the history of movement is very much tied into the sort of apartheid narrative. In fact, one could argue apartheid is all about managing movement. Um, so I was intrigued by this idea of, of, of movement and mobility as a narrative for, for democracy. And that was a shot of what it would have looked like. The, the buildings are trapezoidal because we, we ran a, a wind modeling exercise to look at how wind speeds would change over the next hundred years. And it showed that the normal rectilinear block model would actually exacerbate um, wind eddies and, and turbulence at the ground um, once climate change kicks in. And this was an, int an interesting discussion because a lot of my urbanist friends um, would seek to control the urban form and wanted a very regular form and um, had not designed with the prospect of nature um, um, intersecting with these sorts of realities. And that was that. Um, Haley, do I have five minutes or two or three or one? <laughs> sorry to ask you, sorry. Yeah, it's not Marshall. Um, yes. But we have to wrap up at two, so if you want a longer discussion, maybe wrap it up, but if you want to just... No, I do, I do want a long discussion, but I'll, I'll quickly... Okay, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll blitz through this just very quickly, because I, I do think it's interesting to maybe end with this one. So I, I proposed a, a Museum of Design, Innovation, Leadership and Art a couple of years ago. I set up an NGO, spoke to funders, spoke to MoMA, went through a lot of effort in terms of understanding the economic modeling behind it. And I was just really interested in establishing this um, nonprofit entity because I do think there have been a whole host of amazing innovations and designs across the continent that have not been shared with the world or, or fully disseminated. Um, it was also about creating a sort of innovation precinct where emerging businesses would be allowed to become transitional and then established. And what that means is that you create a series of different architectural and urban opportunities working off existing, um, um, you know, entrepreneurial uh, patterns of, of, of movement and, and, uh, and behavior and saying, how do you reinforce that and create a sort of innovation hub or, or district? Uh, quickly did some sketches, not quickly, did some sketches, let me rephrase. Um, here's a sort of articulation of it. And I was asked about, and this kind of goes back to the, 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 the series that I'm teaching now at, at Cooper uh, in terms of the, the, don't touch my hair. You know, people said to me, oh, so what would, an, what would an African museum of design look like? You know, with the same question that I confronted that confronted me, has confronted me continuously. So uh, my, en my entry point here was, you know, I looked at the work of Ron Eglash. He, he does uh, mathematical analyses of, of African settlements and has demonstrated that there are indeed fractals, both in hair, uh, both in settlements and so on. Um, that, that in fact, using what we call indigenous knowledge systems or IKS, there were lots of, you know, um, reference points and I deliberately decided to explore traditional African star constellations. Um, all of us probably know the, the, the Western Zodiac. Uh, we know if we're a Gemini or a Sagittarius, but I wanted to demonstrate that other cultures have also had their own genealogy, their own understanding of the heavens, their own myths, if you will. And if, if Western culture is able to produce architecture through their own mythology, particularly if we think of you know, ancient Greece, then there's no reason why Africans should not be able to produce architecture through their own mythology. So I looked at particular star constellations um, uh, known to the Greeks as the Pleiades, but with a different name and, and in various, um, various communities. They're called the Silimela stars, actually. Um, and there's different myths from them all the way from Cape Town all the way up to about Kenya. So there's a sort of common sort of mythology with slightly different names. Analyze the quartz uh, rocks of Table Mountain, which is adjacent. Um, uh, to me, and, and Homo situs is a, fr is a phrase of, again, um, Ali Zawari, who I, I mentioned it before, he made that point about um, uh, symbolic sites of being, and he spoke that the future human being will be Homo situs, which is situated man or situated human being, um, which, which actually means that architecture needs to be situated as opposed to universal, uh, which I really, really enjoyed. Uh, he passed away, but he was a great philosopher, and then did some sketches, and then essentially produced a vision 
where this this museum of of design was again for me was driven by these other metaphors so the window apertures are are an algorithm that comes out of this particular star constellation um, all of it was about understanding the crystalline nature of table uh, mountain quartz um, as as well as as well as sandstone and beginning to interpret that architecturally and saying that well indeed you could have a different type of architectural space or language the important part for me about my work is that i'm very much curious about how one can produce architecture that is architecture but does not necessarily go out to mimic either by method or by aesthetics uh, another place but as actually driven by by different sorts of things now i can't claim or make the claim that my architecture is divorced from external influences i studied architecture like all of you i my sense of taste my sense of sensibility is informed by what i see and around me but i'm very conscious about understanding my micro narrative in relation to the meta narrative and the necessity for um for it, where i can to produce architecture that that gives maybe dignity is not the right word but uh, pays homage to different ways of seeing and imagining uh, the world and to argue that those different ways of seeing and imagining the world can produce architecture of the same standard as of any other sort of architecture that architecture is not a linear path um, but actually it's a it's a it's a rhizomatic uh, strategy if you will that allows multiple entry points multiple intersections and multiple adjacencies in terms of what architecture can be and at that point i think i will stop um, I just want to make sure we have conversation. So, I mean, I do have more sh slides to show, but I, I, uh, I, I prefer dialogue. Um, you know what then? Why don't we pause? And if there is silence, we will have um, uh, more images. But I suspect that you've shown us an enormous amount um, of incredibly inspired work. And you... Um, really speak like a philosopher and a political theorist and many other things as well. Um, there are a couple of things that really struck me, which I will maybe just kind of float out there and they could be questions for conversation. And then there were also two questions, I think, in the chat um, that are already. One thing that really struck me was it started with the, um, I guess it was the police station, um, which was an architecture that promotes a sense of confidence and how remarkable it is in these days to think of um, creating a character, right? Creating a, a kind of a sense of um, personality to a building and that that's a, to, to a piece of architecture and how that sense of confidence was also a, a vote of optimism, of confidence in the community, um, and that you often found yourself in a situation where you were treating the future inhabitants of the building in a way that the client themselves was kind of more, offered more dignity than even the client um, had suggested. So that really struck me. Um, another piece really has to do with your metaphors and your allegories and the way that you translate your micro and meta narrative systems into built form. And I'm curious whether it's important to you that any of that be legible or whether as a generative, um, what the, um, say, again, speaking of kind of communicative mm. strategies, Right. What's the um, what's the intent? What's the intended effect, and how mm -hmm. how I'm right? So there's maybe two places to start, and I'm sure other people. I don't know how it works. Will someone chat? Will they <laughs> raise their hand? 
Okay. Well, let's start so, there. Yeah. So um, thank you. Thank you for your warm words. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, with the, with the police station, um, I, I I genuinely had empathy for what it means to be a police person, to know that you go to a community where you are not trusted, to know that, um, and and for many, for all due all due reason, um, but I I always try with every project to try and have a, a sense of humanity, or to try and find the the human dimension in the brief even if it's not um, explicit. And for me, and confidence is not the same as arrogance. So I, 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 you know, I believe that you know, the police are servants of society, but in order for them to do what they do, they have to be confident, but not arrogant. Um, so yes, it was, it was about optimism. I was also struck by your observation that the client, um, that I was interested in more dignity than the client had, 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 had desired. I never thought of it in that way. Um, I think at the outset, I think that's true. By the time the building finished, um, she, she was such an amazing champion of the design and the architecture. And, you know, I, I remember we were discussing what, what plants we're going to put in the front. It was, it was really, it was, a, it was a real journey. But, but you are right. It, it did come from a place where a woundedness. And uh, this notion of woundedness is, I would argue, a South African condition. You know, we, we, we had our transition to democracy. We had our... TR, you know, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, yeah. but um, I still think we're a we're a we're a democracy, we're, we're a democratic project, and I think acknowledging woundedness is in, is an important part of engaging with with people and architecture in general. On on the on the the, the deep question of whether micro narratives need to be legible, I must be honest, no, they don't need to be legible. I mean, I look at Cape Town Station now, right? It has not been. Um, maintained since I finished it. I mean, some of the balustrades are broken. I remember one time uh, I was, uh, somebody from the Aga Khan reached out to me and said I should submit the project. And I, I was trying to explain to them, it's not really a photogenic project because it's, it's about what's not there and it's about understanding what it was and what it is. And, and so for me, the micro narrative is un unlocking a space where people are using it differently, but if I didn't tell you what I had done, chances are you, you wouldn't notice it. So I'm, I'm not really interested that the micro narrative has to be explicit. I'm more interested in the impact and the effect. You know, if I think of the police station, the fact that there's no graffiti on it and, you know, it's, it's, it sounds like a minor thing. So I don't, I mean, I told you that, but I like the fact that there's a building, there's a police station, which, which is respected and loved, which people like to work in. Um, you know, so, so for me, no, the micro narrative is, is it allows me to understand what I need to do to design, but it's not about the, my micro narrative being uh, plastered on the building. As long as the, 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 the meta narrative is the effect that to me is more, more important, you know? Um, and do you, th do you think the meta narrative is intuitive in a way? I mean, the way that you are really mm. addre addressing traces of memory that are getting aged out generationally? So my, for example, let's, let's talk about the, 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 Kailich, sorry, the Kailich Community Center, the Tucson Service Center. It's such an abstract idea that, you know, you oversize the columns to imply a sense of permanence for people who have witnessed their shack being burnt down. I haven't done a survey to see if they accord <laughs> with my assumption. I, I don't know what is the right proportion for that column. I, I, I mean, I, I, a lot of it is very, 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 very speculative, but I do watch how people engage with my architecture post. I do watch how, how and, and I don't know, I, I, I think there is something quite remarkable about how seeing people move in space, you know, the expression on their face, the, whether they clutch their bag tightly or they walk more relaxed. So I, 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 I like to observe how people engage with architecture. And often if I see those little clues, that's, that for me is where I get the satisfaction that I've made a difference, you know? Um, I have friends for now tell, still tell me that, you know, they'd rather walk through the station, whereas 15 years ago, they'd never walk to the station. Uh, my people, I remember there was a, a yoga 
a yoga event in Kailicha at, at my at my facility. Now, yoga doesn't sound like a big deal, but in, in Kailicha, yoga is not a common activity at all. But they were doing yoga there, and people were saying that they want to get married there. Um, I even remember one time I visited the building, and the building manager proudly told me, um, don't worry, Mr. Makeka, the building is doing so well. I'm not letting anybody use it. They keep asking me. And I tell them no. I tell them no. And I'm like, dude, this is for them. But he loved the building so much, he, he thought his job was to <laughs> protect <laughs> so, it. Yeah. To protect it. So, so for me, those, are the, those, are, those conversations are more important to me. And, and that's when I know if my interpretation of the meta narrative is, is correct. So it succeeded. He's in love with the building. But now it's the next level, which is okay. Now have a love of generosity rather than right. a love of selfishness. So how do we love in a different way? Right. So, so um, yeah, and, it, and it's ongoing and it is hit or miss on some projects. Um, but that's also why I prefer public work because going back to my first diagram about private desire and, and public expression, um, I, just find, I just find doing buildings, even if they're not as glamorous, but for you know, the, the, the bulk of people, more satisfying. I just feel that what's been invested in me is being better invested in society. And I don't need my, my micro narrative to be explicit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it helps you generate form. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and would, check myself. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I would love to open up the conversation. Um, I don't know if someone would like to jump in, what someone would like to be called on. Oh, I see Nadir has unmuted. So I know where we're going. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mokena. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here, and so I'll try to start delicately trying to figure some things out. Uh, first and foremost, I'm struck by your uh, ease and lack of anxiety uh, with the Western canons. Uh, uh, the way you have credited uh, from Mies to the constructivist uh, is would go unnoticed in a different time, uh, but precisely because of the conversations we've been having, take on possibly a more poignant role uh, in this discussion uh, as you weave uh, in and out of different uh, continents with different challenges from China to Africa to other places. And so, Let's park that comment for a second while we look at your architecture, which uh, for which you have two modalities of description. Uh, one is organizational and something one cannot understand until you, you acquire a deep uh, almost experiential reading of it, something that requires a, a kind of micro understanding of what it means to be in a space uh, and uh, benefiting from those things, both complex and simple uh, as light. The other one has to do with a, uh, a, an overt interest in language. And by language, I'm not talking about words here. I'm talking about architectural rhetoric, where the formal language uh, of, of architectures may, in certain instances, upstage the organizational, uh, because the iconographic takes on a, a maybe a more enhanced role. And, um, and this is not a critique, but merely a, a vehicle to understand better where mm. your investments lie uh, and, and how do you switch gears from one to the other? And to what degree do you see, um, you, at some moment you talked about one of your projects, I'm sorry, I forget which one, where it was a process of, of editing, not uh, sort of yep. adding. Mm. And so, uh, to what degree, uh, at, you know, can the expression of a building uh, merely emerge out of the organizational? And at what moment um, 
uh, do you leverage uh, the, the kind of muscularity of iconography to, to do all of the work for you? Uh, I don't know if this is a clear question, but I, I'm just trying to uh, figure out where your investments are because the talents are many, but, but so are the projects. And I'm trying to, maybe mm, my anxiety mm. has to do with the fact that you're, you know, you're, there's too many projects all, all along the way and I'm trying to uh, reduce them into a, something more focused. And, and which ones are you fighting for and which ones would you uh, kind of put aside? Or uh, in, in some way I'm saying, what are your favorite projects and which are the projects you hate most? You know, things like that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, great, great points. Great points. And I'll, I'll try and uh, answer the last one uh, and, and build up to some of your earlier ones. So I've been always curious about, about um, uh, genealogy in architecture. So, you know, when you look at a body of work, um, are you able to, to see a consistent thread of, of, of thinking, of articulation? And historically, the, the architects who have been able to demonstrate some, some degree of, of, of genealogy have somewhat been fetid more than the, than the ones who have, have been somewhat all over the place. One of the things that, and I, and I think it's super important to, 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 to be open here, um, I'm, 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 I'm both intellectually greedy in the sense that I'm really interested in new ideas but also at the same time, I haven't settled on, on what are my favorite or what is my direction. And one could argue in some respects, it's almost an immature architecture, right? You know, because I, I remember, you know, thinking to my, you know, even now I do a lot of work at the sort of urban planning sort of scale where it's not even about architecture anymore, but it's about policy making and so on. My, my, my primary interest at the moment is about how, how do I have an impact at a sort of phenomenological scale. Um, and in that respect, the, audi the audience is, is the public. It's not even architects anymore, so to speak. I mean, yes, I might refer to some of the traces of Lise van der Rohe or Ben van Berkel or other, other people who influenced my thinking, you know, Lizitsky, Malevich, uh, Le Corbusier. But um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm answering, uh, answering your question in that I, I acknowledge it's it's eclectic, it's eclecticism, if you will. Um, and in terms of whether that has an implication at the architectural level, I mean, your point about this architectural language upstage, upstage organizational. I just wanna, I um, oh, yeah. Yeah. do you wanna go, Nadir? Uh, no, I'm, I'm listening, that's fine. Okay, yeah. I, I, so I just I, wanted I, to, yeah. okay. Well, Okay. <laughs> well, no, it's okay. Ezekiel, um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish just now and then, and then pop over to you. So I, I think for me, it's, you know, I, I remember when I was uh, taking some judges through one of my buildings and a similar question came up about, you know, why did you do this gesture here? And why did you do that gesture there? Um, and there were times when the, the impulses, the, the impulses were sculptural you know, and, and, um, and I had to almost claim it at that moment. So there are times when the architectural language does upstage the organizational. Um, I'm highly suspicious of architectural purity um, and kind of like the, the metaphor I started out with about, you know, messy cities and messy futures. And I showed that image from Black Panther. I find much more comfort in the sort of in-betweenness of things, you know, um, and maybe it's my own condition. I grew up in New York, family from Lesotho. I'm South African. I'm, I'm constantly in the in-between condition. And I, I surmise, I surmise that a, a lot of the world sits, doesn't sit in neat boxes, but sits in these uncomfortable interstitial spaces. And the question is, how, do, how does one architecturally embrace that? I don't know if I'm answering your question, um, but I, when I look back at my own work, I, I, I always, I always, I even wonder to myself, is there a degree of schizophrenia here? <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, and, and maybe, maybe 10 years from now, I'll, I'll have refined my, my sensibilities, but I've tried to spend a lot of time thinking about what I'm doing and trusting my head to tell my hand what to draw rather than drawing and then post rationalizing and saying this is my style or this is I mean I I design quite differently and I've, I've done graphic novels which I was going to share with you and design tequila bottles 
Um, it, it's a blessing and a curse. I don't know if I'm, I'm helping. I don't know, Haley, do you, Haley, do you want to add? Maybe I'm missing Nadir's question. No, I think you got it. <laughs> yeah. You've got it and more. So I, I, it's just an opening for further conversations. But Ezekiel, maybe you can yeah. take off here. Yeah, I just wanted to commend um, Makeka on a really um, interesting lecture and, and continuation of the conversation of his course um, about a critical history as it regards to efforts of decolonization within the School of Architecture specifically. Um, I think one of the, to, to go off of the topic of, you know, eclecticism, I think one of the things that I found and I find really valuable, valuable about not only this lecture, but his course is that by bringing together all of these threads, like the, the, the topics we're trying to address and the issues we're trying to address in this school right now aren't easy, easy subjects. And, they, and they're not subjects that will be resolved through a kind of monolithic lens. And so I think the eclecticism that he brings and that um, my, my colleagues in the course bring to the conversation, we're often like confronted with our biases in every, in every class as, as, as regards to not only architecture, but um, conversations about uh, cosmetics and appearance and identity as well, because these are all manifestations in a way of our built environments as a result of, um, you know, colonial colonization and, and issues of the diaspora. So I think to just summarize what I got out of this and, and what Makeka says and has been teaching in the, in the class is just the importance of a kind of wide bandwidth in terms of the conversation um, that, that takes place within the school and bringing in various topics that may seem like, that, like they're not tangent, but like he said, um, have some kind of rhizomatic influence. Thanks, Ezekiel. I, and I think, uh, I think just to, um, to build on to that, Ezekiel, I think that if I understand the principles of agonism, it's not to come to consensus. The, mm. the, the, the point mm. is to have the conversation, is to have the, the difficult, um, not to persuade the other people, person to agree with you, but to really come in, face to face with some of your own ideological <clears throat> um, mm. assumptions and values. And that it's only through the conversation that doesn't attempt to um, resolve in any singular viewpoint that that can happen. It is a yeah, absolutely. I think it. I think of it as a kind of benign devil's advocacy, in a way. Like some of the things that I'm bringing up in his course aren't necessarily things that I want to argue, but I think you know they come to mind, and it's it's things that I want to bring up so that I can so that the conversation can be had around it. Mm -hmm. Totally. Are there other, should we, are there other, I don't, I don't, I can't tell if anyone wants to speak because I just see the museum. I'm <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Let me, sorry. that's my bad. I totally forgot. There you go. There you go. Um, Forgive me. I didn't see that. Sorry. Yeah. So then if someone wants to um, signal, because otherwise I, I, I mean, I was worried I wouldn't have enough to say, but boy, I, I could just keep asking questions. There's also a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, I think there's oh, yeah. about informality, informality. Okay, uh, so yeah. let, me, let me read that out loud then. Um, wow, first question is, how do you see Lesotho fitting in architecturally regionally into the issues confronting South Africa? What's the same, what's different, where is your heart? Yeah, well, <laughs> I was going to share with you a project uh, that, I, that I did there, um, which is, uh, I'll be very frank, uh, has, has been particularly traumatic. So I was asked to um, uh, design the royal palace for his, his majesty. And it was interesting at two levels. One was, you know, the, the question of an architectural language for a palace, uh, being the only palace on earth, either under construction or being designed and weighted with 
um, all of these issues of identity and place, but in a, head, in, a, in a homogenous society and what does that look like, but also in a homogenous society that doesn't have the resources of, of say a South Africa or another country. And um, so that was, that was particularly, particularly challenging. Um, I think the design in of itself was successful in terms of marrying those different types of concerns. But in terms of a sort of architectural language for Lesotho in relation to South Africa, you know, Lesotho has had some really amazing architects. Um, it has had some you know, really groundbreaking work, but it just doesn't have um, in, you know, enough of a body or a corpus, if you will, where I would define it as Lesotho architects, Lesotho architecture, maybe Lesotho architects could be one thing. Um, the, 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 the local architecture by non-architects, if you will, um, and the sort of uh, embellishment of, of buildings, etc. cetera. I, I, I think it's, it's also a conversation that, that needs to happen. I think it, it, it's, I'm maybe a microcosm of those issues that, you know, trying to define what does it mean to be, to be simultaneously modern and traditional in the same instance, but comfortable uh, is part of the complexity of what it means for a lot of us because we, we hold very, some of us hold very ancient and you know, pre-colonial um, ideas, practices, worldviews, et cetera, but we also live in a world which, which, which has its own you know, hegemonies. So finding the right language and tenor for, for that in-betweenness um, takes time, uh, both for countries as well as for people, if you're in, if you're in that in-between space. Um, yeah. There was one other question here that I'd like to read out and then yeah. um, how can the quote formal integrate the quote informal to produce a better result for everyone? I'm from Mexico City where the battle between one and the other is constant. I'd like to hear about approaches to engaging and embracing more informal to improve the city overall. That's a fantastic question. So I'll, I'll answer it by giving you an example. I was in Cairo um, eight years ago and we were talking to the officials there and they were lamenting the problem of informal construction in Cairo. And uh, the official said that 70% of the construction in Cairo is informal and it, it must stop. So I said to him, you know, if it's 70% of the construction, then, 70, then maybe that is the formal, right? And that was a total, you know, mind-boggling thing for him because for him yeah. the 30 percent is the formal the 70 percent needs to be eradicated and i say no i mean so that so i think the first step to unlocking the informal versus formal dynamic is a understanding that there's a continuum that flows between them um as i said and it's an uncomfortable thing but i realized that often the formal produces the informal so if you, and once you understand that you can't really engage with the informal unless you convert the formal, right? Um, the various capital flows, the way it structures itself, the systems, and, and the official's comment was, you know, they don't fill out forms, they don't do this. And I said, well, if 70% of people are not filling out forms, that means the form is wrong. It's, it's really that simple. So, so I might be littling your question, which I think is significant and it's a global problem because modernity has given us this idea that, that order and structure is the formal and that therefore everything should succumb to that. I'm of the opinion that in terms of these cities that we were designing for, we need to reinvent the formal instruments. So if people aren't filling out forms, maybe there isn't a form. If people, you know, you know it's, it's all about, again, giving dignity to those activities which are happening on the ground, ennobling them, giving them virtue and supporting them so that the distinction between what is formal and informal eventually blurs away. Uh, perhaps in a utopian fashion, like the Black Panther image that I showed, but um, which is maybe a good example or a bad example, but I mean, th th this issue of informality and, and the mind block that people who are trained in a particular way have around the informal is one of the reasons why we have such unequal societies today. It's the inability to imagine what the informal can bring into the conversation. Sometimes I think that um, modern, modernism and architectural design is a form of OCD. Right? Everything is supposed to be tidy and nothing should touch anything else and everything should be equal, equal distant. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I know yeah, I just, we, we, sorry. Right. I know no, we I'm just going to add on to, oh, yeah. to mm -hmm. no, no, super quickly, just to add on to say, you know, the, the, the importance of the incomplete project as a notion, 
um, is something that, you know, so in other words, <laughs> I, I, I'm not convinced that uh, the architecture of control, that I know each and every single junction and, you know, I, I'm much more interested like Chart Cathedral, where the architect is essentially engaged with a number of different stonemasons and wood carvers and so on. And the architecture emerges out of a, a controlled chaos rather than the, 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 the master with the pen sitting on the corner uh, doing everything themselves. And I think the modern project has given us this bizarre idea that control equates to, e equates to order, whereas I don't think control and order are the same thing. I think too much control produces yeah. dystopia. Yeah, anyway, I'm going on. Um, are there any, anything else or I'm gonna make a uh, final comment? Oh, Richard. I, I had a quick question that might uh, try and link something that you asked Lauren uh, with something that uh, Nadir asked, which is really, you asked about the use of um, metaphors, whether they're geographic or historical yeah. or, uh, uh, and um, whether it matters if they're, if they actually could be read in a project or whether they're, um, not merely, but important as a, a part of a generative process. But uh, Nader asked what I thought was a related question, which is, you know, what what in the in the end drives a pr uh, is the beginning or drives a project in terms of whether one starts with a language or with a with a, a certain kind of form or whether you start with the, with the organizational and sometimes uh, functional determinants of, of the project you receive, and it would it would be I guess the conventional thinking would be that um, only by sort of starting with form or with, um, with a certain language could, can you deal with those translations from a metaphor and allegory that, uh, that, uh, from previous works, et cetera. Even, even if you're occupying, for example, the form of a, a, a work of a previous architect or a previous historical mm. form. So, so, and I saw that sort of gradient in your, in your projects. Um, uh, so, um, can you speak to that a little bit? If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and please jump in if I'm, if I'm misinterpreting you. Uh, my, my projects never start through form, um, believe it or not. Even though at university, they would accuse me of being a formalist because I had quite elaborate buildings. And I was like, you don't get it. I get there because I think about it. I don't get there because I'm trying to make a form. Um, and, and, and all of my projects start with actually, I would say a small political question. And then I then ask myself, now what is the architecture that can answer that political question? So if it's the trophy, for example, and I've been asked to make a trophy that is somehow supposed to represent Africa, then the political question isn't the form of a trophy. The political question is what is Africa? If I'm being engaged to do a police station to stop crime, Yes, that's the brief, but for me, the political question is, how do I humanize, even for myself, the way that I think of the police? And that triggers, well, I need to think differently about color. I need to think differently about form. I need to think differently about, you know, muscularity. Like the police station is, I try to make it like gentle because I wasn't trying to project, I was projecting confidence, but I wasn't trying to project power. The community center is stout and you know, you know sits on the ground. And there I was trying to project almost a classical presence, but I wouldn't have got there if I was trying to create the classical form first. For me, the proposition was, hey, it's Kailicha, and I know people there, and they literally don't know if they're gonna lose their stuff in six months' time. And living in a state of precarity, how do I make an architecture that makes you feel a little bit more rooted? So my I, so the forms always come out after uh, me being very explicit about my bias about what is the brief. Sometimes I actually don't listen to the client about their brief, which doesn't really work well. I, <laughs> initially, well, I hide it, but basically what I try and do is I say they're saying all these things. What are they not saying, right? And 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 then and then the architecture emerges, you know. So that's what's so fascinating to me about the fact that you were talking about character right personality yeah. and when that yeah. is kind of what what is the social emotional need yeah. that, that i need to meet here yeah. um yeah. and because i'm the moderator i might get the last word um and every i'm getting all these notes about studio 
Studio Studio 2 p.m. I would love to continue this conversation. I think that the, the mo most remarkable moment um, is the, the smoking room, the decompression yep. room, the outdoor yep. smoking room garden that you added to the program um, that was not asked for in the program. Um, but you added to the program through a, a kind of practice of radical empathy. To actually, no one asked you to imagine the daily life of a police officer, but that is something that you brought to the program and said, we, we need this extra room, we need this other thing. Um, and I think that um, I would, you know, love in particular all the students here to kind of really acknowledge that moment of um, projectively inhabiting and architecture, that's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I wouldn't have been able to produce that form if I didn't ask, what do they need to decompress? If I had approached the project formally first, I never would have produced it. So for right. me, form comes out of, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Quiet. So when you yeah. ask, like, is this good or bad architecture, you're not talking about the object, you're talking about the practice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. That was really thank inspiring. You. Thank you, McKenna. And L Lydia, uh, Lydia, thank you. I'm uh, very much for inviting me to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, McKenna. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.